Hey everybody, with the flu rampaging through Texas and around the nation right now, we've been getting a lot of phone calls and emails about Tamiflu, whether someone should be taking Tamiflu or whether they need Tamiflu, etc. So I figured it was time to put out a video and let everybody know what the general consensus is um, in both the functional medicine world, but also the conventional medicine world. Because basically we've been lied to as a people. Tamiflu is not as effective as we've been told. Um, we as Americans like to do stuff, we like to fix stuff. And so whenever we have a problem, we always like to treat it. And so the treatment for the flu is Tamiflu. And we've been told that it's it's a great drug. After all, flu is in the name, so it must work, right? Well, there's some some conspiracy and uh, some, some bad data around Tamiflu. So I printed some notes and we're gonna go through it piece by piece and we're gonna unravel what Tamiflu is and what it works for. So a systematic review published in 2014 in the British Medical Journal, that basically means they looked at a bunch of studies and then kind of combed through and came up with what are the outcomes from those combined studies. These authors actually took four years to campaign in order to get unpublished data about the drug before they could even do this study. So one of the conspiracies around Tamiflu is that Tamiflu was released before the studies were even published. How a pharmaceutical can be approved without all their data being published sounds a little fishy. It's not cancer, right? Although people do die of the flu, so I, I, I understand the urgency. So let's look at what the authors found. There were 23 reports for Tamiflu. Three were immediately thrown out because they were just terrible. So that left 20 studies with moderate quality, they say. And then half of those studies had problems with basics of the study. Half. So that means we're down to half. They included these half, but they had problems like randomization, allocation concealment, masking of participants, recruiting of patients, and reporting outcomes. Now you may not know what those mean, but my doctors that are watching and my nurse practitioners and anyone in the medical field knows that problems in those compartments or areas are kind of a big deal in medicine. So let's move on as if those 20 studies didn't have those major problems, and let's look at the successes they had. So a success was defined as reduction in time for the first signs of alleviation of symptoms, basically. And so for adults, the average age of symptoms for the participants that were not treated um, or got the placebo was seven days. If you got the Tamiflu, you were a magical 6.3 days. So that gives you a 0.7 re days reduction of symptoms, but you also get all the side effects of Tamiflu included in it. Now children got a little bit better. Their average symptom reduction was 29 hours. Um, so still not an amazing. So if the average duration was seven days, that means they're like 5.8 days. Um, as far as total symptom duration. And then they looked a little further and said, well, did asthma benefit? Because frequently in medicine, um, where if someone's sick or has lung disease or asthma or anything like that, we're much more likely to pres prescribe Tamiflu. And actually in children, there was no difference in children with asthma, no difference whatsoever. That's disappointing. Um, the likelihood of vomiting is much higher with treatment. Now the flu can cause some GI distress already, so taking a drug that's going to make it worse is not a whole lot of fun. So you might be miserable for only 6.3 days, but you're vomiting during that 6.3 days. Um, and then only one study showed decrease of influenza rates with prophylaxis, which means I take Tamiflu every day in order to prevent getting the flu, and apparently that only had modest benefit as well. So a lot of sketchy data already about Tamiflu as far as its benefits being overtoted. So I already kind of mentioned some of the suspicious behavior around Tamiflu. Let's look a little bit further. So in the, when the drug was first released, there were no adverse effects associated with use of the drug in the published trials. Notice they didn't mention any of the unpublished trials because they, didn't, they weren't available. So in the published trials, there were none. But after the drug was, was released, post-marketing showed raised liver enzymes, hepatitis. You kind of need your liver, so that's important. Uh, neuropsychiatric events. Now, I didn't dive into my notes here, but I remember reading about depression and possibly some suicidal effects. And it actually is worse in children than it is adults. I don't know if anybody's ever seen a depressed child, but it's it's scary to see a child that's depressed. Um, that's always very worrisome. Now it goes, it should go away after the Tamiflu is, is um, removed. Cardiac arrhythmia, which means um, rapid heartbeats or changing heartbeats, um, can mean death. And then there's skin reactions. Now, you may not know what these skin reactions are, but anyone that's in the medical field knows that Stevens-Johnson syndrome is a bad thing. You can die. There are very few things you can die from in the skin world, and Stevens-Johnson is one of those because you pretty much bleed from everywhere, um, and that's not good, apparently. Now, the next one is called toxic epidermal necrolysis. Now, you probably don't know what that means, but you can assume that anything that starts with toxic is probably not good, and that one you can die from also. Uh, and then erythema multiforme, which usually isn't a big deal, but not fun. 
And then here's more suspicious activity. Despite its lack of efficacy that you just heard about, countries poured billions of dollars into this drug. And the, I only have two country statistics, uh, well, continent, UK stockpiled $710 million for 40 million treatments, just in case there was an epidemic so that Tamiflu could be released. And the US spent, we always have to be better, right? The US spent $1.3 billion for 65 million doses. Now, I'm not gonna get into the conspiracy theory of it all, but that sounds a little fishy that we spent that much money on a drug that isn't that great. Now, we're under an epidemic, pandemic, whatever you wanna call it right now, and have we seen any of these billions of dollars poured out into the country? I don't know, I'm not up to date on it. Tamiflu is expensive. Now, it's now generic, so I think a, a 10 pill prescription, which is usually what we, what we, how we prescribe it, you take a pill twice a day for five days, which is 10 pills, that usually runs around 50 to 60 bucks. But that means you're paying 50 to 60 bucks for a 0.7 day reduction if you're an adult. That's not a very good use of money. A massage would probably be a lot better. Um, and then I, I found this quote at the end of this, this study, very, very entertaining, so I'll read it to you. Um, this is straight from the study that I'm quoting from. A cocktail of pandemic panic, publicity propaganda, and scientific misconduct turned a new medicine with only modest efficacy into a blockbuster drug. It appears that the uh, multiple regulatory checks and balances gave way as science lost its primacy and pharmaceutical enterprise lost no time in making the most of it. This reminds me one of Professor R.P. Feynman's statements after Challenger space shuttle disaster, quote, reality must take precedence over public relations as nature can't be fooled. So there are clearly some problems with Tamiflu. Um, I, I usually encourage people that if you were, if you're otherwise healthy, just battle the flu at home, take whatever over the counter medicines or, or natural as you want to do. Elderberry is apparently really popular right now, though I've never really used it or tried it. Um, and then just the, of course, blow your nose, sinus rinse, whatever you can to keep the, the nose going. A lot of people worry that it's going to their chest and they're going to develop bronchitis and need an antibiotic. That is false. Bronchitis is almost always a virus and you may not know this, but the flu virus is a bronchitis virus. So if you do have the flu, you're almost always gonna have that barking cough that moved down into your chest, and that's okay, that's part of the virus. As long as you're breathing well, as long as you're not short of breath, you don't necessarily need any additional treatment. You can try the albuterol inhalers, um, which are the, the puffers. Um, sometimes that helps people, sometimes it doesn't. What I usually tell people is if you try one and it works, great, keep doing it. If it doesn't do anything, then it may not benefit you. Now, everything's thrown out of the window. If you have asthma or any kind of lung disease, everything has changed, and so you definitely need to talk to your doctor about that. But as far as a, a regular healthy person um, experiencing the flu, mostly we just have to suck it up for about, apparently seven days. Now, if you're stressed and overworked and you're, you're inflamed and all that, you can expect that your flu is gonna last a whole lot longer than seven days. The seven days is a statistical average, which means some people are only three days and some people are 14 to 21 days. So take care of your immune system. One of the things we frequently do here is do high dose vitamin C infusions for those patients. Ultimately, the flu is the flu and it's not gonna be a very fun seven days, but you can do things to at least reduce your symptoms and you were not born with a Tamiflu deficiency so just because you have the flu or someone told you you have the flu doesn't mean you need Tamiflu. Um, that's all I have, and uh, hopefully you have dodged the flu this season. I was not so lucky. Bye, guys.